una actividad, nos está avisando Zoom que están grabando la reunión, gracias Zoom. Les voy a enviar por el chat la primera actividad del día de hoy para conocernos mejor. Tienen que ingresar a este link que les acabo de enviar, que es Luma Maps, no sé si lo conocen. Queremos saber desde dónde se están conectando esta mañana, esta mañana de viernes. Simplemente tienen que ingresar su nombre, yo voy a escribir, Vanessa, les voy a mostrar cómo se va a ver en su pantalla. Ahí escribí Vane, pongo Join the Map, y automáticamente voy a ver todas las personas que se están sumando. A ver quiénes somos. Tenemos acá una, como una pizarrita que nos va avisando que ya tenemos 16, 17 miembros adentro, y tenemos gente desde Argentina, como yo algunos de Buenos Aires, desde Chile, Brasil, Bolivia... Tenemos de Perú también, ¿dónde más? Ecuador, a ver, a ver, Guatemala, México, ¿desde dónde más se conectan? A ver, a ver, me encanta, tenemos también gente de Córdoba en Argentina, Dani de Quito, Cristina de Ubatúa, de los de Quito, a ver, a ver cómo va subiendo, 34 miembros tenemos hasta ahora que se unieron al mapa, Gracias, gracias por sumarse a esta primera actividad. Dani ahí nos saluda desde la mitad del mundo. <ríe> Tienen acá un chat también interno por si quieren dejar un mensajito. Gracias por sumarse, nos gusta hacer mucho esta actividad para conocernos de alguna manera a la distancia y ver desde, desde dónde se conectan y cuán, cuán diversos estamos siendo ¿no? a través de esta sesión. Así que ahora sí, sin mucho más y agradeciéndoles nuevamente a los 38 miembros que se sumaron a esta actividad, en esta mañana de viernes vamos a mostrar la presentación que tenemos para el día de hoy. Les agradecemos que se estén sumando, ya casi estamos por llegar a las 50 personas y les damos la bienvenida oficial a la sesión del día de hoy que es Metodologías para Construir Comunidades en Encuentros Virtuales y tenemos el honor de recibir a Fabián Formüller. Antes de continuar con esto, solo algunas eh, normas de, de convivencia. Sean muy bienvenidos, pueden tomar capturas de pantalla si tienen alguna inquietud o no desean que su imagen sea publicada por terceros, pueden apagar sus cámaras cuando lo deseen. Las grabaciones y las presentaciones van a ser compartidas con ustedes a través de su correo electrónico, eh, por medio del cual se registraron. Si tienen problemas de conexión, intenten apagar el video para poder al menos escuchar. Van a tener traducción simultánea, para eso fíjense que en la parte de abajo de, del Zoom van a tener una barra de herramientas, como con una especie de mundito, ahí pueden seleccionar eh, la opción de inglés-español, ya que Fabián nos va a dar su charla el día de hoy en inglés. Pueden utilizar el chat para realizar comentarios o preguntas sin ningún problema. Lo que sí les vamos a pedir es que por favor respetemos las ideas y comentarios de todos. Y los vamos a alentar a publicar lo más destacado de esta reunión en todos sus canales eh, de redes sociales. digamos. No se olviden etiquetar a arroba BMW Foundation y utilizar los hashtags BMW Foundation y Responsible Leadership y también Responsible Leaders Latam y Hashtag Impacto. Por favor, les vamos a pedir también que pongan sus micrófonos en silencio eh, y que se renombren en el caso de que estén ingresando con un nombre distinto al de ustedes. Recuerden que tienen tres puntitos arriba de su imagen y tienen la opción renombrar para poder cambiarlo. Ahora sí, eh, esta es un poco la agenda del día de hoy. Eh, vamos a tener una mínima presentación de parte de Michelle, luego la presentación esperada de, de Fabián, y luego vamos a tener un cierre con preguntas eh, si nos da el tiempo. Ahora sí, eh, Michelle, te doy este micrófono virtual a vos para que des la bienvenida oficial. Muchísimas gracias. Eh, déjenme... Me confirmo, configuro bien, qué bien, qué excelente verles a todos ustedes el día de hoy. Es hermoso, hermoso, hermoso volvernos a encontrar acá eh, un par de semanas después, eh, todavía inspiradas, todavía leyendo las postales que nos enviaron eh, Diego y Cris la vez pasada. Para quienes esto, esta es su primera vez, les doy un poco de contexto. Eh, eh, esta, esta workshop series está siendo organizada eh, entre varios responsible leaders de, del eh, BMW Foundation, que es una comunidad 
preciosa, divina, de gente eh, eh, de alrededor del mundo eh, que trabaja pues construyendo comunidades, que trabaja eh, conectando gente y pues que ha hecho de su vocación pues eh, eh, encontrar la manera de resolver los, los grandes problemas que, que tenemos en el mundo, sociales, ambientales eh, y, que, y que bueno pues han decidido hacerlo mediante la colaboración. Entonces esto es, eh, ima, eh, imagínense qué hermosa comunidad es esta, ¿verdad? Eh, bueno, nos encontramos nosotros en diferentes eh, puntos de nuestras vidas, en diferentes, eh, en diferentes ciudades, nos, nos seguimos encontrando y muchos de los responsible leaders pues dijimos, bueno, esto, como esto que nosotros hacemos como que tiene una ciencia, ¿verdad? Pero también tiene un arte. Eh, esto que nosotros hacemos, que es construir comunidades, pues es, es, una, es un título que nadie nos ha dado aún y que tal vez hace unos siete, ocho años, ese, esa, esa profesión no existía. Eh, pero eso no significa que, eh, eh, que hoy por hoy eh, no sea algo que tengamos que profesionalizar, que, que, que compartir y que, que, y, 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 y que necesite una comunidad de práctica. ¿A qué me refiero con una comunidad de práctica? A esto. Eh, una oportunidad de juntarnos eh, de, eh, cada, cada tres, cuatro semanas y compartir alguna herramienta, algo que nos ha permitido a nosotros pues eh, construir unas nuestra comunidad de mejor manera. Eh, y así fue pues la invitación abierta de, y, y respondieron cuatro increíbles responsible leaders eh, para decir, bueno, yo, yo voy a compartir y no solamente quiero compartirlo con otros responsible leaders, eh, quiero compartirlo con toda América Latina. Entonces, por eso tenemos aquí gente que tal vez dice, mm, ¿qué tiene que ver la Fundación BMW con todo esto? Y otros que dicen, mm, ¿qué tiene que ver impacto con todo esto? Eh, bueno, es, eh, es eso, ¿no? Es, es una colaboración eh, y es, es que aquí tenemos muchísima gente de todas partes de América Latina, eh, unos que son parte de los Responsible Leaders y otros que han sido invitados eh, por, por nuestra red eh, para compartir, eh, para aprender y, y bueno, pues para, para disfrutar sobre todo esta sesión de la mañana. Eh, esta segunda sesión es muy importante para nosotros porque también nos salimos un poquito del cuadrado eh, y dijimos, bueno, estamos invitando a Responsible Leaders de América Latina, pero ¿por qué no invitar al menos a uno, uno muy especial, eh, de fuera de América Latina, que también es parte de la red. Eh, y bueno, pues así fue que nos lanzamos y dijimos, bueno, Fabián, sería increíble poder eh, invitar a Fabián a que nos comparta eh, no solamente una herramienta, sino un poquito también de, de esa magia que tiene eh, de haber sido uno de los pioneros en realidad en trabajar en esto de construcción de ecosistemas. Eh, es un honor para nosotros tenerlo aquí eh, y también es un honor para, para los que lo organizan organizamos tenerlos a ustedes acá. Entonces, es, eh, eso nada más, darles la bienvenida una vez más. Y bueno, pues eh, vamos a dar paso a la presentación de Fabián. Gracias, Vale. Muchas gracias, Michelle. Para quienes no la conocen, Michelle es la CEO de Impacto. Y ahora le vamos a presentar a Fabián, que tiene un apellido muy difícil para nosotros para anunciar, pero creo que es por Müller. Eh, él es uno de los responsible leaders, como, como venía diciendo Miguel recién, él es constructor de ecosistemas de comunidades suizo, pero está en Nueva York, es cofundador del Together Institute y coautor de Community Canvas. Es innovador residente de la Fundación Kaufman, cofundador de Sandbox y cofundador de Holstein. También es creador del Holstein Manifiesto. Ayuda a construir y co-dirigir la iniciativa Generation Listen de NPR. Es un orador frecuente en eventos y organizaciones de todo el mundo y es miembro de la Royal Society of Arts de Londres. Así que con este tremendo CV y background académico y profesional le vamos a dar eh, la bienvenida oficialmente y el micrófono virtual a Fabián Formuller. Welcome, Fabián. Wow, ok, gracias. Buenos días a todos. Um, yo no hablo mucho español, um, per, pero gracias por invitarme. Me llamo Fabián, estoy en Ámsterdam y um, espero que la próxima vez uh, yo pueda hablar español. Soy en, uh, yo entiendo como un poco de español, pero... Uh, oh, it, it, now I hear the translation into English, which is funny. Um, um, Sí, pero voy a hablar en inglés. Gracias uh, por invitarme. Um, okay. Um, it's nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, 
what I'd like to share today is my work has been around um, bringing community together and building ecosystems of people, of humans. Um, that's, that's where my heart is. And I'd love to share with you a little bit of my journey and some of the things that I've learned. I'm gonna go into my presentation. So just give me a second as I pull this up. Um, and you can always, throughout this time, you can always interrupt me if you have a question or if you wanna say something like, you know, I invite you to um, ask me, I invite you to like interrupt. Sometimes on Zoom, it's a little bit harder because I cannot look at your body language. I cannot see you uh, when I'm in the presentation mode necessarily, but I, I invite you to um, interrupt me and ask. And so we can also start to go into conversation. Um, all right. Well, maybe before I start, um, I'd love to ask, um, I work with community. I, I, most of my work is with community. And yet very often I find myself in an environment, in a conversation, and I'm really confused uh, what people mean by community. When they say the word community, I'm like, I don't even know what people say. Does that happen to you? Has that ever happened to you? Um, and I've worked in community for 15 years and it still continues to happen. I think like community seems to be a mystery. Um, and for me, like I had a, had a special moment about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, where I was living in New York at that time. Oh, and I can hear some background noise. Um, yeah. And no, no, Mr. B. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, and I was living in New York at the time and I was walking into a grocery store to buy some salad. And as I pick up the salad, I want to look at like where it's made and like what the ingredients are. And I see that my salad community, salad in, invites me to join a community. And I was very perplexed by that because it made me realize that we live in a world where community means anything and everything. And it is really up to us to define what community means for us. And my journey really has been again and again to come back to this and redefine and explore and better understand what community means for me. And I'll share a couple of perspectives of what community means for me. But at the essence of it is like, I love this photo, which is um, two, two friends of mine, like hugging at a, at a gathering of a community that uh, it's called Sandbox and that I co-created um, like maybe like 15 years ago. And for me, this is community. This is like this kind of sense of care, this sense of generosity, this sense of kindness and embrace. For me, that is the essence of community. And that is very different from the pack of salads that you saw before. There's a big gap between those two things. Um, and I became very curious, like, well, what, what is it then about community that makes the difference? Um, and so in 2014 and 15, I started to just ask a lot of other community builders, well, what does community mean to you? And when you build community, like, where do you start? What do you do first? And what do, you, what do you do next? Because I found that in my own experience with building community, I often just, nobody guided me. I, I didn't have a manual. I just was figuring things out by myself. And, and so as we started talking to many, many people and we ended up talking to over 120 people, we started to see some pattern and similarities on how people build communities. And what came out of this was this, framework that we call the community canvas, um, which is an open source framework. It's like freely accessible. You can just find it online on the community canvas. Um, and what we try to do is map out. If I find myself in a place to build community, where can I start? And what are some of the questions that I need to ask? And what I definitely learned is like, the more I know about communities that I know that every community is very different. And the answers for every community are very, very different. They're so much dependent on the context and on the geography and the culture and so many things. But what I find is that what is similar are the questions, the questions that people can ask themselves while they build it. And I'll briefly introduce this model. Um, this model has three parts to it, as you can see. 
there's a red part, there's a blue part, and there's a green part. The blue part in the middle is what we think of like the heart at the center. It's like the fire in the middle that brings people together. It's questions around identity. Like, why do we come together? Why are we here? Who are we and why are we here? That's like the questions that we ask ourselves there. Questions around purpose, question who is this for, but also questions around values. How do we want to treat each other? Questions around brand, like what are the stories that we tell each other? And then maybe also like, how do we define success, which is very closely connected to values? This is like, we think of it literally as a fire in the middle because it's the thing that attracts us and brings us there again and again. Then on top of it, we see the red section, which is the experience. It's on purpose the biggest part because the experience is what makes a community. A community is us coming together and doing things together, being together and sharing things together. And ideally an experience has a beginning and an end point. And between we have rituals, we have, we have actual shared experience, we have stories, we have some rules that define and we have roles. So those were kind of the, some of the basic things we think, saw for experience. And then at the bottom, kind of a small part, but it's kind of like the foundation that it sits on are questions of structure. What we find is that communities that don't care for structure, um, they often don't survive for more than like two, three years. Um, and, and questions of structure are questions around money, power, leadership, uh, really things that are kind of not that important at the beginning, but in the long term help to add to the sustainability of, of a group or not. Um, so that's that's the basic of the model. Um, it is really quite straightforward um, in that sense. And you can read more about it online. And um, I'm, I'm sure we can put a link in the chat uh, where you can like download it. It's also available in Spanish. It's been translated into like 13 different languages. By, by volunteers and um, everything should be available in Spanish. And if you're thinking about, if you find yourself in a place to work with a community or start building about a community, I recommend you look at the different frameworks we provide. And one specifically a framework that I recommend is what we call the minimal viable community framework, which is really we try to figure out what are some of the most important and basic questions to start with. If you only had to choose um, actually, I see that it says nine, but it's actually only eight questions that are listed here. Um, I played with this recently and I forgot to change the numbers. But if you had on one page to summarize some of the most important things for your community, this is what it should allow, allow you to do. Questions around who is this for? Why do we come together? Principles and values, how do we show up? Motivation and needs. Why, why do people really show up and what, what do they need? practices and rhythms, um, roles, communication and power. Those are kind of a couple like suggestions um, to, to kind of get you started and to help you think about a community. Um, now for today, I thought about, we can talk more about this model, um, but I felt when I was thinking about um, what to do, I thought that all of you seem to be interested in ecosystem building. All, many of you probably already are ecosystem builders. Um, and what I thought could be interesting is to share with you some of my perspectives of what I learned about ecosystem building and what I think contributes not just how to build an ecosystem, but really to make an ecosystem thrive and to flourish. So that's like my, my suggestion to share a couple thoughts on what will help an ecosystem thrive. Does that sound like a good idea or a good use of our time together? Just looking if I see some like nods or, yeah, okay. And you can like interrupt me and, and, um, and stop me whenever you'd like to. Um, first, this was published in 2017, this community canvas that you look at and my journey has evolved. I continue to work with different communities. I've been building communities um, and my thinking has changed. And one of the big things that I think um, I actually don't like that much about this model anymore and I think I will change in the next version is that it looks very much like an engineering blueprint. It looks like something you would need to build a machine. 
And what I've learned is like the more I work on communities and the more I think about community and ecosystem is like ecosystem is not a blueprint and a machine. Ecosystems is this. Ecosystems are, I think, nature is a much more a representation of what an ecosystem is. And I think in my own perspective, I, I found that when I talk about community building, again, that's kind of, or even a stronger word is network. Network is a technical word. Network is a word that is kind of like out of the, the computer world. Um, it's an engineering word. Um, but I think like weaving, gardening, nurturing, taking care of, um, I think that kind of language is much more in line. And I think it really matters to change our mindset around that. Because what we're building is something, is not a dead machine. We are weaving a, a human, a living being. Ecosystems are living beings. And I think that really matters. And I think that that makes a big difference on how we approach things. Um, I'd love to pause and see like what that brings up for you. Um, and just to, maybe I'll just take a quick stop here with the presentation and just pause and see like, what, what does that bring up for you all? Does that resonate? How does, it, how does that reflect with your own experience? I see Carolina Senna, please just go for it. I invite you in, I'd love to hear your perspective. Thank you, Fabian. Um, well, I'm not sure if to say it in English or Spanish, but I'll go for English. With um, with regards to the to to the structural part of 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 communities, like one one thing that resonates is like because too often the communities that we invest ourselves into, like we go for like the intuition, the sense of belonging, all that. Like we leave aside the structure, but then you said you said something about communities not lasting more than two years is it because they don't pay attention to that so like you really not need to invest in structure to sustain them so that's uh, that's something i'm curious about or can it uh, can that get in the way of that um, belonging and that um, yeah and that sense of connection that it's like well why do we have to talk about like structures of leaderships and like some some uh, some communities that I've been part of recently, they're more loose in terms of leadership. Like you said, like oh, we're horizontal, but then decision making gets complicated or nothing gets done. So, so can you tell us a bit a bit about that? Like how do we deal? How do we infuse structure into communities without losing that sense of? Uh, you know, we're all in this together. We, you know, we share power, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your question, Carolina. I think it's really, I applaud your sensitivity to that balance of wanting to keep the feeling of togetherness and being in this together versus also investing into structure. I think you're already like pointing to, I think it needs to find a, a balance uh, between the two. And what I found is particularly that money and power are really important things to pay attention to. Like when we think about, when I look at why communities don't survive in the long term, um, the reasons are um, that community builders burn out and often burning out has to do big, with money questions because they're not paying themselves or can't afford and they're just doing it as a volunteer everything and that is a really important question and it's uncomfortable to talk about money I find it very very uncomfortable to talk about money in a group because let's say if this was our community here and I was your community weaver to ask you then to kind of give me money to invest into this community it's a very uncomfortable ask and I think that's part of the art of community building is to learn to talk about money in a good way. I'm still learning that myself and I don't know, I, I, it, it's a, it, it really is an art, I think. Um, and that's part of it. I think the other part is also, the other thing I'm learning is how, um, is there other ways we can appreciate the community builders um, besides money um, that they don't burn out? And I think a lot has to do with saying thank you. Um, 
I, I know a lot of community builders who put so much in, but they burn out because nobody really acknowledges them. Nobody says thank you or very few people do. And, and that can be really exhausting. Um, so can we create a culture of gratitude and of saying thank you to the people who do a lot for the group? I think that in itself could be really powerful for the community. And lastly, I think you, we also uh, pointed to like um, power. Conflict is real. Like if if um, if we if we stayed in this room for long enough, at some point we would have a conflict. That is unavoidable. Why? Because we are different. We have different opinions. We are not automatically always on the same page. And at the beginning, we will like um, we can we can scrape over that. And there's a certain honeymoon phase that we are willing to like, you know. Um, we can pretend everything is perfect. Um, but at some point, if we go deep, there will be differences. And when there's differences, there will be conflict. Are we prepared for doing that? Do we know how to work through it? Or will we fall apart when conflict happens? So those are, I would say, two things I would pay attention to on the structure. Um, and um, and that, could, that can kill an ecosystem or not. I hope that does justice to your beautiful question, Carolina. Gracias. Yes, it does. Thank you so much. Um, okay, I see more questions, which is beautiful, and you're more hands up. I um, so I'd love to maybe hear another one or two questions, and then I might share a little bit more something, and we then kind of come back. Um, but um, Silvia, I saw your your hand up. Uh, would you like to to share your perspective or question? Yes, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and greetings from Bolivia. Um, I. I Everything resonates a lot, and you know it reminds me of a paper we wrote for SNB, the Dutch cooperation, many years ago. It was called titled "Art and Power of Alliances." Actually, my entry point to communities initially has been through strategic alliances, right? And uh, I was thinking that we talk about communities, like just they are dynamic, living, living, I don't know, structures or bodies. But I think that what resonates me or what I, it brings me to think a lot is about like a community approach, right? We, we speak a lot about gender approach, human rights approach, because right now, personally, I'm, I'm working a lot also with like institutions, like NGO networks, like, you know, and all kinds of organizations, civil society organizations or even you know industries and there is you know the challenge and the invitation to change the mindsets of the leaders in terms of yes a community approach of an organization even even if it's, if it's a very formal so my question right now is what would that imply and i think it has to do with a lot with unpacking some concepts and some some assumptions and i think where does power lie is it only well it can be very explicit but usually and where are the expectations so so uh, I, I was thinking, yes, how could be we frame a more like a community approach that is applicable to you know different kinds and types of institutions or formal or less formal organizations? Thank you for your question, Silvia. Um, I I think working with organizations and convincing them to invest into community-driven approach is really hard. Um, I find it really hard, um, and um, why? Um, because organizations are used to work in a hierarchical way, like power in organizations is structured in a hierarchical way. There's someone who has more power than others, and almost all organizations work like that. And communities don't work well like that. Um, and to unlearn that is really, really hard. That's one part. The other part is also goes around success metrics. Um, most organizations measure success by tangible deliverables, tangible outputs. And as someone who's been building communities for the last 20 years, I love communities. I think they're magical and I think they change the world and they suck at providing tangible outputs. We can, we can like, we can make up some proxy things and we can tell some stories of like the collaborations that happen and the learning that happens. Uh, but really the output of community is, you know, love and care and generosity and solidarity and, and, um, and, and that then leads to also collaborations and learnings and trust and all these things. But to point to that is really hard. Um, and those are, I'm not giving you any really 
since I'm not really giving you any perspective of how I've learned to do it, I can just tell you like where I'm struggling. And it is, I found those two areas are my main areas of struggle, the success metrics and the um, kind of the, the power dynamics. Um, and often also, um, um, especially in the not-for-profit sector or in the foundation sectors, organizations also don't, re if they are the convener of a community, they actually often forget the power that they have just by being an uh, organization with a lot of money or with a lot of resources um, that people show they might people might be showing up for the wrong reasons if you are enough for if you're in a foundation that has a lot of money and you're convening a community you have to be aware of why people might be showing up and it might be not because why you think they are and to overcome that power gap is 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 difficult it's possible but i think it's difficult um, yeah, thank you for your beautiful question, Silvia. Um, maybe we take one more question. Um, I see Marina had her hand up. Um, Marina, would you like to share your perspective? It doesn't have to be a question, it can also be a perspective. Thank you. Gracias, Fabian. Muchas gracias. Quería hacer una consulta y es. Um, antes hablábamos de las diferencias entre las personas, cuestiones de poder en una comunidad, ¿cómo se resuelven en una comunidad estos problemas comunitarios, ¿no? estos emergentes que, que generan un problema? ¿Hay algunas técnicas, mecanismos? ¿Cómo una comunidad llega a un acuerdo para seguir avanzando cuando tiene un problema comunitario? Quizás, Marina, querés escribir en el chat la pregunta, si se la parafrasear, digamos, o traducir al inglés? I also oh. heard, I heard, I heard the, the interpreter. She, oh, great. I heard the question. Awesome. Thank you. Um, whoever is the interpreter, I actually don't know who you are, but you're doing a beautiful job. Thank you. Um, um, yeah, Marina, thank you for your, for your question. Um, there are frameworks that help to, um, to deal with power questions in community. Um, you might have heard some of these terms being thrown around, um, like holacracy is one of these concepts these days that's quite in favor. And it's pretty much just like a, an approach of how power is shared. Um, in general, I think, um, and I can put a couple, uh, if I have a little moment, I can like pull up a couple links and uh, you might also find some things in the community canvas if you download the guidebook in it there are some like suggestions around that one of the basic things i've learned about power is again that um there's quite a lot of things um in communities i think that are like a muscle um and at the beginning when the group comes together the muscle is very weak but if you keep doing the same things and keep like talking about the same things the muscle becomes stronger and stronger and I think power is one of these things like for us to use a different way of being with each other and using power differently is uncomfortable at the beginning. But if we keep doing it for a year or two, it becomes easier. Um, if we, uh, if it feels gonna be very uncomfortable to talk about conflict in a group, but if, if it becomes normalized and practiced over the years, it becomes easier. And I think there's a lot there around power. Um, a big thing is the difference between consensus and consent. One is um, everyone has to agree and that's, or the majority has to agree and that's how we make a decision. That's how most communities organize, but it's actually a very stifling and can be quite an exhausting way of, of, of organizing power. Why? Because um, something called circle, there's something called circle fatigue where you just go around and you hear everyone's opinion and everyone, in community, everyone always has an opinion. Um, and if you are the person, Marina, if you're the person who has to actually then like do something, get something done and work with this decision, can be so exhausting to hear everyone's opinion and like try to get to a consensus. Um, but there's the other approach, which is to say, we don't need a majority. We need someone with a proposal. And then all we need is that no one blocks this. So if we have a proposal, anyone can propose something, as long as it feels safe enough and good enough to try, we
we can move forward with it. So that's a different way of thinking about power where that enables much a quicker way of making decisions. Um, so that's just a little example. There's more frameworks like that. And I'll try to share a couple links. Uh, if I get a, a, mo a break, in, I will do it in the chat. Um, and if not, um, I'll try to point to it also in the, in the follow-up. Does that help with your question, Marina? Cool. Thank you. Um, I will, um, with your permission, I see Francisco has also his end up, but with your permission, I will continue a little bit um, and I will just share another point, which I think um, might also enrich our conversation um, because I would love to talk with you all about that. Um, so I'm gonna go back into my presentation um, and I just have to find it actually where it is. Um, and Francisco, I hope you forgive me and I'll, I would love to hear your perspective once we, once we have another break. All right, that's where we were. The second thing I think a lot about uh, when it comes to community is this difference between consumers and co-creators. What I found is that in communities, there's two ways for people to show up. One is as a consumer, and the other is as a co-creator, a co-owner of the community. And they make a big difference for the group. The consumer shows up and says, oh, this is interesting. This is your group. I'm coming here and I, it just, what can I get out of this? What can I get out of this today? I have certain expectations. I want them to be met. If they're not met, I will probably disengage. I will complain maybe, um, but this is a transaction and I wanna get something out of it. Um, and if I get something out of it, this is great. But if I don't get something out of it, it's not gonna be, I'm not gonna really engage with this regularly. The co-creator is different. They say, oh, this is our group. This is my group. This is our group, this is all of our group. Um, I'm part of this bigger group here. And I'm trying to figure out like, how can I contribute? How can I bring in my gifts into this group? Um, like, what are people doing? How can I help people? How can I maybe take on responsibility? How can I receive things? Yes, but also how can I give things as well? The co-creator, co-owner is much more committed to this group um, in the midterm and in the long term. And the question that I think a lot about is like, well, how do I turn consumers into co-creators? Like, what's the difference? Like, how do I turn one into the other? And, um, and what I've learned, one of the big things we, and I'd love to talk about it with you is, what I found is it's real, we as the organizers, we as the community builders, our role actually really has a big impact because here in the consumer, I feel like I need to provide all the value. I need to give everything to the consumers because I'm the organizer. I need to provide everything to them. And it can be really exhausting and it can be really, it's just a lot of pressure on my, on my back. As with co-creators, my role as an organizer is not to provide value to them, but rather to create an environment where they can create value for each other, where they can like help each other. That's my role. I'm there to facilitate. I'm there to create an environment. I'm not there to create the value directly. And this mindset shift is one of the big, biggest thing I need to go through because again, what we talked about before, in most organizations where we work, we as the community builders are there to provide value. Our role in most of work life is to create value for others. In community, our role is not to create value for others. Our role is to create an environment, a framework, where people can create value for each other, and where, where, where we can like facilitate um, people supporting each other. And I'll show, share one more thing and then maybe we'll pause again and, and ask. And the more I think about community, the more I learn about community, um, I, I think about every group, I think about like as three concentric circles. At the middle, is often a small group of committed stewards. Probably those are people like yourself. 
those are the people who run the community, who want to serve, where they're really bought in and they do most of the work. Around that is the middle circle of the active members. The people who really care about the group, they show up, they give um, their members, but they're also their engagement is to some extent limited, you know? And then around that is often a very large circle of the passive consumers, people who just show up to get something out of this, out of this group. And what I've learned is that every group I've come across has all three levels. All three levels coexist in all groups. And I think what, what our role is, is not necessarily to turn all passive consumers into active co-creators, but rather to like create opportunities for people to switch. And because the other thing that I've learned is that often the same person who at one point is a, let's say this is a member journey and at the beginning, it's kind of passive, but then they become like active and um, over a while, they become even like they take on a role, they become a steward. And then they move somewhere else and they have a kid and they like are super busy with work. And for a couple of years, they, be, they kind of become inactive. But if you look for in most communities that I've been with where you zoom out for long enough, let's say 10 years or 20 years, the same person goes through many of these similar things. They go through many different roles and like all of a sudden they move to a new city and the person wants to engage again with community um, and all of a sudden they become active again. And I think what our role again here is not to turn all the passive people into active people. And I've tried that and it's exhausting and it never works. Um, but it is to acknowledge that those differences exist to create different uh, experiences and to create paths, fluidity between them, where people can choose and step up and say like, yes, I wanna become more an active co-creator, or maybe I won't even step in to become a steward, or no, I wanna be kind of a passive person in this group. So I just said quite a bit, we talked about uh, active co-creators versus consumers. We talked about these different things. I'd love to pause again and just hear I would love to hear what that brings up for you, how you reflect on this. Like, how does that make sense with you? And let me ask you this question. How did you show up to this call today? How did you show up to this call today? Was it as a consumer or as a co-creator? And why is that? Who'd like to share their perspective? I'd love to hear what do you, what do you think? And no judgment. I uh, <laughs> there's no judgment in this. I'd love just to hear your perspective. Um, Eduardo, I'd love to hear your perspective, and and then I see Carolina. I just love to hear a new voice. So we go with Eduardo first. Hola. Hi. Eh, bueno, mi perspectiva es que yo tengo una comunidad en Perú eh, y fue una comunidad que elegimos libremente por un trabajo de sinergia, encontrar cómo ayudarnos mutuamente para desarrollar nuestro país. Es una elección muy difícil porque también tenía familia, tenía un negocio, pero me di cuenta de que mi negocio y mi familia no podía seguir conviviendo en el mundo que vivíamos si no actuábamos y solo quejarme no ayudaba. Así que decidí involucrarme más con mi comunidad, aportar parte de mi tiempo voluntario. Sí, tienes razón, es difícil cuando tienes otras opciones de tu vida que tienes que manejar y aprendí a manejar mis agendas de tiempo, pero para contribuir y apoyar, a pesar de que eso no me genere ingreso, pero ayuda a que otros se desarrollen. Y si formamos una comunidad de sinergia colaborativa, 
también se desarrolla la población y al desarrollarse la población puedo encontrar oportunidades para que mi negocio vuelva a reflotarse porque están conociendo lo que estamos haciendo para ayudarlos a cambiar. Entonces es importante para todos eh, dejar un poco la eh, visión de solo ganar tú, sino que si ayudamos a ganar a todos, creamos comunidades productivas, enseñamos valores, apoyamos a que el ecosistema respondamos no solamente a la necesidad del ser humano, sino que tenemos un ecosistema en el cual somos responsables. Si yo me destruyo la bioeconomía, destruyo el agua, ¿qué va a pasar para mañana? ¿Qué va a pasar para mis hijos? ¿Qué va a pasar para los que todavía no vienen? ¿Y cómo me sentiría en mi multiculturalidad? De, ellos lo cuidaron para mí y yo lo destruí. Entonces, la única forma es actuar en conjunto. ¿Es difícil? Sí. ¿Es, es complejo? No. Porque cuando empiezas a escuchar a las demás personas y entender que no eres el único que sabe todo y que aceptas ayudas, eh, podemos lograr cosas interesantes. La idea es que no se queden los que iniciaron, sino que empezar a atraer a este consumidor pasivo que tú has mencionado, pero de una forma que él también sienta que está aportando, que está ganando y que se le está dando importancia. Por eso en nuestra comunidad tratamos de hablar de que no existe poder, sino somos todos iguales para un futuro mejor, para volver a ser humanos. Thank you for your beautiful perspective, Eduardo. I, I like it. I, I, um, I love your, the vision you paint and I agree with it. And I struggle a little bit with sometimes in my own work with how to get there. Um, but I love your, I love your, the vision you paint there. Um, and one thing I very much pick up on is like, or maybe one thing I want to point to is like how you spoke to the deep listening. I do think one of the most powerful things in community building is, is to listen to each other. And, um, and that's, that's, I would say is, is probably like the most powerful thing to do in communities to listen, both as a community weaver and as the community to each other. And the other thing I picked up it, or maybe I'm reflecting on in what you're saying is that, you know, um, I think community building is nothing new. I think ecosystem building is nothing new. We've been, we've been as humans and as life and as, as animals and as nature, we have been as an ecosystem, as community for thousands and thousands and thousands of years and millions of years. Um, um, but we've forgotten, we've like gotten away from it a little bit, I would say in the, in this phase of individualism and industrialization and whatnot. And, uh, um, and I think a lot of community is about going back and remembering uh, more than inventing, more than like having to look for new approaches. I think it's, it's to think about like, what are some of the old ways and, and bring them back. Um, so that's a little reflection from that. I'd love to uh, bring in some more voices. How do you reflect on this? Um, and um, maybe I'll go with uh, Mina. Um, Mina, would you like to unmute yourself? Yeah, sure. Sorry that I cannot turn on my video. I, I, this is a, like a mystery to me because I'm two times here. And one of my alter egos raised the hand, and I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but, but it is good. Probably it was destiny. And, and my, my question reflection would be more about, I'm a community builder. And recently, it has been like a, a, a very interesting challenge to move a network that is more transactional to a community. And at the beginning, the, when we started asking if we want this network to, to become a community, it was very polarized and there were people that they were yes and there were people that they were no and in that moment we decided that well if, if everybody's not okay with that probably we should not do it but then all the things that have happening in the last years make us reflecting that it is necessary a community if we want to, be, to continue working you know and without without asking or without doing the, the things that they were the way at the beginning we started working as a community you know it was like very organic 
And now that you were mentioning that even in a community, there's going to be people that they are there more in a transactional way, that they are not going to participate that much. Makes sense. Probably we should have decided this since the beginning, you know, we were trying to convene the opinion of everyone. And at the end, the ones that they are not going to participate, well, they are not going to participate even if it's a network or it's a community, right? So what, what is very interesting to me is this, this time that we were, we were mentioning about these three years, it is about the, the people that is in the center and if you change that, if you are going to make them last longer or this is like a time in which normally communities start getting tired. I, I would like to know more about, about that now that we are building something to I probably be aware that this is a process that is going to, to happen, have, have an evolution probably in which we, this natural and, and we have to, to, I don't know, plan it on advance. Thank you. Thank you. Could you help me? I don't think I fully understood your question. Can you just help me a little bit uh, better understand your question? Yeah, about these three years that you were mentioning, that is a time for a community. So if you are building a new community, it, I consider a community that is like a living being, you know, it's going to have a process, probably it also dies in that time. I don't know if it's correct to think about it. Uh, but why? Why do you think that in three years this is happening? And imagining that it's not the money, the, the issue. It is that something that is going to happen. It is because of the people that is managing it. This community should not last more than three years. Uh, and then you need to have changes. I don't know. I would like to know a little bit more about that short period of time in which they, they last. Okay. Thank you for, for bringing up that thing because I think that might be a a misunderstanding. I think I'm, um, I'm a big fan of, I think communities need like a 10, 20 plus, like I, I want to build communities for like 100 plus years. I think, you know, communities become more powerful the longer they exist. Um, and, um, um, and I might just have said something confusing around the that, that time frame. maybe the three years came from the, the structure elements where I felt, um, my own experience has just shown me that if people, if communities don't pay attention to questions of power and money um, and organizational questions, that then that often comes to hunt them at some point. Um, but I, I do think that one of the key elements of community is longevity. Um, and actually, I have a quick slide that I can show around that, which is that, um, you know, I think one of the key elements is is longevity, and with that, I think is also the rhythm. Um, one of the main issues that I see with with communities is, let me just quickly point to the quick slide. Um, I think a lot of a lot of communities um, work in this matter where they like have a big peak moment, like maybe a big conference and maybe a big event, something, and then everybody's so excited and everyone loves it. And then it like starts to fizzle out and like, you know, like it becomes less and 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 less. And then like a year later, they put on an amazing another big event and like the excitement is high again. Um, and then it starts to fizzle out again. I see that with a lot of communities. We call this like the peak and valley approach. And again, like think of like a human being, think of a heartbeat. Your heart needs to beat very regularly. You need to beat very constant. Um, otherwise you're, that um, uh, or you have to revive yourself and and what I found is that again like the, I think the gardening metaphor here also counts like you have to give water every day or you have to give water very regularly but you only need to give a little bit of water um, if you only water your plants every six months or every 12 months but you give them a lot of water it doesn't work I've tried that it definitely does not work um, and I think the question that we need to ask ourselves is what is a healthy rhythm that we can keep up for a long time? What is, what is a consistency and a heartbeat and a rhythm that we can commit to and say, okay, we can just keep doing this for a long, long time. And again, like often people I think choose too much. Um, last year during uh, Corona, when Corona first kind of came up and everyone started to do virtual events, I saw a lot of communities that, um, that started to host like five events uh, a week or like, or one event even a week. 
And I thought that was good, but I, I knew that was not healthy. You cannot keep that rhythm up. You cannot keep up such a rhythm. Like we are often volunteer driven or it's not our only thing or whatnot. What is a healthy way to do that where we can really be very consistent and make sure the email goes out once a month and the event is organized every two weeks or every month, whatnot. And one thing I want to share, like um, um, you asked also before about like timing and again, like timing, I, I think the power of community is a long-term game. But what I see is that um, I'm in a community, like I'm, I'm co-hosting a community right now where we've been, uh, we had a gathering about two years ago. And since then we've had like monthly calls every month for about two years. And now after two years of having calls every month, I start to see people attend for the first time. It's very interesting. And it, often happens and what what i think is happening is that people um we we have a lot of communities to choose from and we just assume that most communities will not survive and we are be like let me see if this is still around in a year from now um because if yes i'm going to give my energy and my time to it if this is just a short term like it's not going to be around for, for for a long time why should i give my energy to it that's the, at least the personality and the archetype I observe in, in, in communities. And so if they see you do something very regularly for like a year or two, all of a sudden you will have people at your events and your gatherings that were, were very passive because they need some time to trust you and to trust that you are going to be around for a while. Um, so maybe that's a little like reflection on timing and on the rhythm and on consistency, which I think is really, really important to, to a thriving ecosystem. Um, Cool, Carolina, you've been had your hand up for a long time. I'd love to hear your, your perspective and um, you can reflect on this. You can ask on something else, like, please. No, I mean, I think a lot has been added already by the previous voices, but it really resonated, like, the importance of, of the fluidi flu fluidity and how important it is, especially, you know, we've seen that uh, during the pandemic and how, you know, some, for example, families with small children at home, like we're not able to participate as much as they would want to in some of these engagements, right? Like how do we take that into consideration, things like that to make our communities um, more inclusive. And I think Mina touched on this, that it's like the, that um, the BMW Responsible Leaders Network, like it has this like magic that it's a non-transactional community right and like that's so different from many others and so refreshing as well uh, and um, so yeah so so it resonated a lot because like seeing it like okay this is where some of these elements come from so so thank you but I, I really appreciate you know that transition from moving from consumer to co-creator and how do we as as, uh, as drivers also try to uh, infuse that into, into our members, like to understand like, you know, you're part of this community, it's to also participate, also to drive things together. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Carolina. And if anyone has like ideas or reflections on how we can uh, like, you know, set the people's mindsets to show up as, as co-creators, I'd love to invite them and, and hear them as well. Um, Maria, I'd love to hear your, I see your hand up, I'd love to invite your perspective or, or question. Okay, hello everyone. Well, I was looking to this graph with all the ups and downs, and then I thought like, okay, like everything in life is with ups and downs, but when we are creating a community, how do we keep our community motivated? I think it's a big, a huge challenge. So I would like to know like your tips or hints uh, to this. And like reflecting on this question, then I thought like, okay, sometimes I have my, my own ups and downs in life and what keep, keeps me going on. And I thought it was my purpose. So maybe that's like, like a tip, like we have communities and then maybe we need to look inside our community and see what's driving our, our work every day. And maybe purpose might be this, this like, uh, the clue to keep going and to keep everyone motivated in the community. So I would like to hear more about it. Yeah, thank you, Maria, for your for your um, reflection and question. Um, yeah, I think in terms of long term motivation, I um, what keeps people showing up again. I think one is to accept that people will not always show up 
actively and that people will go through different phases and that that is natural. I think that's one of my reflection that it is okay if that happens. Um, the, the second thing I, I think of is also, I think purpose is a really important part. Um, I think maybe I, I reframe it differently. I think it's really powerful to be clear and be really explicit about certain things. Purpose is one of them. Expectations is another thing. What are the expectations that we have towards members? Um, what is the commitment we're asking for? And how can people contribute? I think those are really, those are really good things and values probably too. Um, I think it's really good to be explicit and clear around that. And I find that some communities, they have a sense of purpose, they have a sense of, of these things, but it's kind of vague. It's kind of somewhere hidden. And, and especially for new members that can be really hard. And, um, you know, I find that um, what, what I learn in my community work is that um, um, people want to often want to contribute, but don't know how to contribute. Um, and they are grateful to give them avenues and pathways to contribute. And I think that's our roles as ecosystem builders or community weavers to, to help them and to show them pathways. Oh, um, Maria, do you want to choose the song for the next session? Uh, or who would like to like co-facilitate part of the next session or who wants to give a little present? You know, we have to provide these little like doorways and then see who takes them up. Um, but I think that's part of, I think that's part of our role. I hope, I don't know if that helps you, uh, Maria. It's a, it's a beautiful and hard Yeah, question. sure. Yeah, thank you. It was a great answer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see Henata from, from Brazil. Um, Henata, would you like to share your perspective or, or ask a question? Yes, thank you, Fabian. Uh, thank you for all your insights. We resonate a lot. I'm sorry I cannot turn on my video. I don't know what's happening. Um, it's not allowed. Uh, yeah, uh, it's re re regarding the rhythm, you know, that you said uh, to keep the rhythm. Can you hear me well? Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, considering that, deep, like, we have all these different people in the community, you know, the passive consumers, the cookers, and uh, they expect, you know, like, different rhythms would fit different profiles, right? So, how to balance this because there are people that want uh, uh, want more things and different offers and some uh, want less things. So how what's your experience in balancing the community rhythm with the personal rhythms, the different personal rhythm? A yeah, beautiful question, Hinot. I I'm not sure if I have a lot of experience. Like I'm, I think that's also one thing I'm, I'm just learning and, and figuring out myself. What I know is that mm, the more you go to the circle center, um, uh, people want like, you know, um, Maria before asked about motivations. Um, and I think one of the core motivations I see that really gets, keeps people there. And I think that's always, no, not always, that's, often neglected in more networks and more kind of in the outer circles is, is intimacy. People want to really have a deeper human connection with someone else. And I think, I mean, that's so obvious that that is what, it, what community is about. And yet that's not what we get in most of community. We are used that in most of community, we get like a superficial version of, of relationships um, and, and kind of a maybe because it's virtual, maybe because there's a lot of people there, maybe because it's very broad, who knows? Uh, but I think unfortunately we've become used to like accepting quite superficial relationships. And, and I think the more I go to the center, um, intimacy and like real depth of relationship becomes kind of a key motivator. And I think that also reflects and into the format and into the rhythms. Um, and my sense is that for co-creators, uh, sorry, the difference between co-creators and and um, and consumers, part of it is around is around rhythm. I think part of it is also just, um, I would say, consistency and commitment. Um, so what I mean by that, for example, is that um, a good format to work with with like an outer circle um, um, is a webinar. 
or something where like people can just show up as a consumer, people come or cannot come and people can plug in. And that works both for the consumers as well as the co-creators. A format that really only works for committed people is and one we use a lot is we call them home groups. It's kind of the idea that you take a group and turn it into smaller subgroups. So we have 63 people on this call today. Um, imagine if you would turn this group into uh, 10 groups of six or like 12 groups of five ish, you know? Um, and imagine if that would become like your peer advisory group. Um, and you would say, okay, we now gonna meet every month for 90 minutes to check in with each other, to hear how everyone is doing, to support each other. And maybe every time one person will present what they're working on and get some feedback. That is a very powerful format, but it needs a real commitment. People really need to show up. And, um, and that I found only works with like kind of a more uh, people at the center, more co-creators and more um, kind of stewards. Um, I think it's incredibly powerful and people are very motivated by it, um, but it really needs a real commitment. So Hinata, I'm not really answering your question because I think I'm, I don't really know an answer. Um, but those are some of my reflections about it. Does that does that help you any further, or like where do you where do you go with that? Thank you, Fabian. Uh, yeah, it, it it helps. Yeah, uh, and I, we're also discovering that, so we can uh, school work together <laughs> and exchange further <laughs> in the future. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there any other reflections, any other perspectives that someone wants to share? Um, you know, we've talked quite a bit about rhythms and about timing. And I'd like to share one more thing, which is that another thing I think quite a bit at the moment is seasonality. Um, and um, I give you, you know, let me show you kind of a couple of example uh, from some communities. Um, um, Pulling up my. Um, when, when you look at an ecosystem, most ecosystem goes through seasons. Seasons of growth, seasons of rest, seasons of heat, seasons of cold, um, seasons of like, um, we're just gonna not do anything at all. Um, and I found that and what, the question I ask myself quite a lot at the moment is like, how can we bring this idea of like a season also into the communities that we work with? Um, and um, with like two of the communities I'm part of and, and I help facilitate, for example, we realized that this has been a very, very intense year for Corona reasons, for spending a lot of time on Zoom um, and, and people are really tired. And so we decided, okay, you know what? We need a season of rest. And we just said, okay, we're gonna take the summer off. We're going into a, a summer, we're gonna have the summer being kind of a season of rest in our community. And then we're gonna have another gathering and we're gonna go more into like a season of meeting and season of doing things, season of learning. But I do think the idea of seasonality where things happen regularly, but actually with like different tempos and different intensity, um, my sense is that can be a very healthy thing. Um, and right now, and it's a little bit contradictory to what I said before, because I said before, you need to keep up the rhythm again and again regularly. I think that's true. But at the same time, I also really think that communities need rest. Communities need moments of reflection. They need moments of healing. They need moments of, they just need different seasons also. And one thing I think we can talk about, like, and think about, like, what, what could be good seasons for, for our, our communities? So I'll pause here again, and I just love to open up. Like, what are some perspectives? And you know, we're coming. I think to if I'm my timing is right, we're coming to the last fifteen minutes of today. So maybe we can just hear some like people's reflections. And what are you what are you taking away from today? What are some of the things you're taking away uh, from today's today's session? I'd love to bring that into the conversation.
Uh, Gabriela, would you like to speak? Would you like to share? You're still muted. You were unmuted for a second, but now you're muted again. Sorry, thank you. Thank you. Now you're muted again. How weird. I don't press anything really weird. Okay, so I'll just look at it. Um, I was taking and I was thinking on on how you can have different roles on a community, no? And how even us that are community builders sometimes feel like like we have to change, no? But but it's like you made it. You have to be like on the spot all the time, no? And and having this flexibility of thinking that you don't have to be always in the center, that you can move and that others can move. And how do you let that happen? For me, it's something that that you move and also. What they were saying in the chat that that Negrito was sharing on, on how and that you were sharing just right now, how to let to listen to the community in their rhythm and and what they need, no? And and I think it's difficult because sometimes some of us hear some things and other members of the community aren't hearing other things. But I think um, talking about it and putting it on the table and saying that it's something important to say and and to think about. And to be conscious, that would be really important. So that's what I'm taking. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gabriela. Beautiful reflection. Who, who else would like to share a reflection? Or what, do you, what are you taking away from today? Fabian, can I say something? Yeah, please. Hey, oh. A... oh, your name is not Mina. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Diego. Oh, Hi, Diego. You were raising your hand. Great. <laughs> no, but uh, let me see. Uh, if I link through Mina, it's because probably Mina was sharing the link online. That's why. <laughs> Sorry. Uh -huh. No, I wanted to say something about community building in the sense that. Um, is often seen as an access as a very important accessory to the cost, the goal, the whatever that you want to achieve. Um, but and it has been one of my discourses, and I keep saying in many places, the process is the goal. The building of the community is the goal. So what you want to have is a platform and heal it and nurture it and make sure that it's functional because you don't really know when this community is going to go in a different direction. So yeah, you're working on child issues or you work on a community that relate to this, but at the end of the day, the important tool is the community that will be focusing on this, not whether this is the project, because then you always make it dependent on a specific goal, the goals can change. And the important thing, the most difficult thing is to build the social tissue. Uh, that takes a long time, it takes a lot of nurturing, it can be destroyed quickly. And, uh, and so that, that, that is the delicate thing that we have to be careful about. So nurturing, holding, and, and, and facilitating the community itself is the goal, in my opinion. And yeah, and so to respond uh, to Carolina, yeah, I, I'm using Mina's login. So it was me, it wasn't Mina, actually. Beautiful reflection, Diego. Um, I've you know, I personally agree. I, that's how I live my life. I think that, I think that relationships are life. I think relationships are, are everything. Um, and and I, I I personally think that our focus so much on productivity and outcomes, we forget what's what's kind of the essence of it. And um, yeah, I do think that's very very much. Um, um, well, we have some more ref uh, hands up. I'd love to hear your perspectives. Um, Julia, I see your your um, your hand. Would you like to share your your perspective and what you're taking away? Hola, hola. Muchas gracias, y Fabián. Me ha encantado todo lo que has dicho y lo que me gustaría decir que a lo mejor algo que pasó, quizá un poquito inadvertido o que no se vio, pero el hecho de lo que acaba de decir Mina de lo delicado, de cómo hay que cuidar esa comunidad, y cuando tú hiciste algo que para mí tiene que ver con comunidad, con un factor sistémico, cuando tú diste las gracias, por ejemplo, a quien está haciendo la traducción hoy día, lo hiciste como algo de manera muy natural, solo que eso 
habla también del cuidado del ecosistema, del cuidado del espacio que está ocurriendo en este minuto. Y, y eso quería comentarte lo que eso delicado y ese cuidado creo que es no menor. Entonces, algo que puede haber pasado así, pero la verdad que creo que es una de las bases también de la, de la comunidad. Eso, gracias. Thank you, Julia. That is a beautiful thing to receive. Um, you know, I, I want to point to something that you're saying um, and take it just away from my personal example, which is that I think role modeling is one of the most powerful ways of shaping community. The way we show up as the community we versus how other people will start to, um, to act. And I think I see a lot of communities who write their values and who come up with nice mission statements. Um, and, and I think that's good, that's a good start, but really I think values um, are picked up by some people role modeling it and people then just starting to act like this. And one of the things why I love communities the most is because these groups can have different values and better values than we have in everyday life. We can be more generous with each other. We can be kinder with each other than we have in everyday life. I think that in my opinion, that is the biggest opportunity and beauty about community to create environments where we treat each other better than, than in other places and for that to translate and to move forward. So um, thank you for your beautiful reflection, Julia. Um, Marlon, would you like to share what you're taking away from today? Uh, gracias. Me llevo como tres ideas. Lo uno, de que las comunidades tienen su propia personalidad con rasgos característicos que les, les autoidentifican a, a ellos mismos. Dos, eh, cada comunidad también tiene unos momentos y esos momentos es como el ciclo de vida de las personas. Nacemos, maduramos, toca morir, nos enfermamos, estamos sanos y, y todo eso es, eso es, digamos, parte de la naturaleza y no está ni bien ni está mal, solamente ocurre. Y finalmente, de que una comunidad sobrevive cuando existe una visión compartida por parte de sus, de sus integrantes. Gracias Fabián, gracias Impacto, Michelle, Daniela. Thank you, Marlon. Beautiful, beautiful uh, reflection, beautiful summary. Um, yeah, thank you. I'd love to pass it on. I see Michelle has um, uh, her virtual hand up. Michelle, I would love to hear your, your voice. Eh, gracias, Fabián. Eh, voy a hablar en español eh, para, eh, porque me siento un poquito más cómoda con eso. Eh, a mí lo que me, lo que me quedó muy, muy interesante fue ver este gráfico de los ritmos. Eh, pero algo que me, me, me pareció muy interesante es que, digamos, eh, incluso la curvatura del ritmo es muy orgánica, muy natural y muy suave. No, he, no había picos muy, no había como picos eh, muy, muy agudos, no había estos sharp edges. Eh, había una... una eh, no sé, una naturalidad en cuanto a, es, a esa onda del ritmo y, y creo que eso es interesante porque creo que todos podemos navegar una ola constantemente que va sube y baja, pero creo que muy pocos de nosotros podemos eh, aguantar mucho tiempo si, si los cambios son muy drásticos. Eh, y y es, eso es algo que, que, que me vino a la mente porque dije, ok, si necesitamos descansar, podemos descansar mañana, ¡pum!, y desaparecemos. Y en realidad eso sería muy drástico porque si tal vez piensas que estás descansando, en realidad no, es, es, necesita, es, necesitas entrar a los procesos con tranquilidad y, y salir con tranquilidad. Eh, y eso me lleva mucho porque, porque es algo que, está, que, que hemos estado pensando mucho en el equipo con Dani en cuanto a estos, a, a estos ciclos de, de, de descanso. Así que muchas gracias. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I, I'd love to just add something or add a perspective to that, which is that, you know, um, one thing I'm learning more and more in communities that force doesn't work. Um, and I used to, I used to think force works quite well because that's how we do most things in life. Convincing people, getting them to show up, doing really 
big things do kind of heavy things and and i found it's kind of a little bit like in you know star wars the movie with the jedis where they like try to like work with the force that's there i think that community building is kind of that sounds very cheesy but i think it's kind of like that where our role is not to put any force on it but to play with the force that's there to play with like the energy that's in the room and because we all are humans we have so much energy um and our role is just to like unlock that play that play with that um and but we don't have to like force anything onto people how to do that i'm still learning every day myself and i struggle with that every day um i see yabets um um and i don't know if i'm pronouncing your name correctly um sí. how, how sí, do you perfecto. say your first name ah. perfecto hola fabian es, es correcto ya ves eh, mira eh, disculpen por no prender la cámara es, estoy en, en tránsito así que perdonen miren el me, me, me suena mucho toda esta conversación y, y hace sintonía con la experiencia que tengo en Wisher. Recuerdo mucho haber comenzado desde el mundo corporativo con estas estructuras verticales donde tú das la indicación y, y se hace lo que la directiva manda. Y si no estás con, con ganas, bueno, sacas ganas de cualquier lado para hacerlo, pero, pero, pero hay que hacerlo, ¿no? Eh, cuando comencé a trabajar con, con Wisher, a, a intervenir en, en los proyectos, eh, uno de las personas con quien comencé a trabajar fue Albert Cañigoral, que deben conocer algunos de ustedes, y, y me llevo sus palabras porque él me decía, mira, no te estreses tanto y mira dónde hay energía. Si hay energía, las cosas fluyen. Y si no, tranquilo, eh, llegará el momento en que las cosas comiencen a, a echar a andar, ¿no? Así que... Eh, eso demandó mucha paciencia, mucha, digamos, eh, despertar esta habilidad de, de, de prender la antena y saber cuándo hay energía y no. O sea, también eh, entender eso, ¿no? Eh, poder captar de la gente si hay la energía suficiente para poder insistir o no en, en alguna acción que queremos tomar dentro de la comunidad. ¿no? Y finalmente, eh, eh, no estaba lejos ni, creo que ha coincidido con toda esta reflexión que tenemos, así que eso ratifica muchas cosas que, que venía trabajando, así que gracias por darme esa confianza de que estamos en el camino. A beautiful reflection, Yabet, thank you. I, I also, you know, as I hear these reflections, I, I um, sometimes I pick up a word or two that, that resonates with me, especially, and I think it's patience. Like, I think, I think, you know, patient approach is like the one that that wins with community. I think we talked about the timeline. Um, but I also, I keep thinking about, you know, if you walk into a rainforest or if you walk into like an ecosystem, right? Like things don't happen quickly, um, but a lot of things happen. Like life, li it's very much alive. So much happens there. And I think um, my sense is that's the biggest teacher for all of us is if we build ecosystems, let's let's sit in an ecosystem and just listen and wait um, and learn from that. I think there's, there's my perspective is there's um, much more to be learned from that than from like traditional organizational um, workings and designs. Um, maybe that might be my closing thought. Um, I, if I'm correct, this is like, we're getting to the end of our time together. Um, so I'd love to hand it over to Michelle, um, or from the from the team, I just want to say thank you to to you all. It's so you know, um, it's really nice when when you come somewhere and uh, you put something out there and people speak with you about it. I'm so grateful for all of you to be so actively in this conversation and sharing so openly and kindly. So thank you very much, and thank you to Michelle and Daniela uh, for inviting me and bringing me here. So with that, I'll pass it back to you, Michelle. Thank you. No, thank you, Fabián. Um, muchas gracias, Fabián. Um, muchísimas gracias a todos los que han participado por todos sus, sus insights, por estar regalándonos pues estas, eh, este tiempo tan importante. Um, me, yo me quedo con con muchos de estos chats que decían, bueno, para una, esta constructora de ecosistemas cansada, yo me acabo de refrescar. Y creo que esa también es, eh, es la idea, ¿no? Eh, refrescarnos, acordarnos que pues no estamos solos y que hay una como esta meta comunidad de constructores de comunidades que, que compartimos esta vocación. Eh, y, y, y gracias a ustedes. Una vez más, gracias a Fabián. Eh, acuérdense que este es, eh, es el segundo de cuatro sesiones de, eh, acerca de construcción de 
ecosistemas. Eh, vamos a tener eh, eh, dos más y voy a pasarle entonces a Delos para que nos comente un poquito eh, de, acerca de, de, de qué más eh, se viene, eh, qué información nos vas a enviar y para quienes se conectaron con los links de otros, por favor, les pido que eh, de, le escriban a, por el chat interno a Delos para que ella pueda... Eh, eh, para pueda incluirlas en la, en la lista más, más amplia de todos los que han participado. Eso, eso es, eh, de mi lado, Delos. Sí, o, sí o yo, Michelle, muchas gracias por tus palabras y gracias, gracias Fabián perdón. también <ríe> por, por esta charla tan poderosa y todos esos insights que nos, que nos dejaste. Creo que los participantes, miren, se mantuvo el número desde el principio, estuvieron tan contentos y disfrutando tanto de esta charla como, como todos nosotros, así que te agradecemos enormemente por, por tu tiempo. Eh, como decía bien Michelle, esta es el seg la segunda edición de cuatro ediciones que vamos a tener. La próxima va a ser el 29 de julio, como podrán ver acá estamos proyectando el próximo orador que va a ser Leonardo Maldonado Leonardo, para que tengan una idea, es el CEO de Gulliver, cofundador de Boma Chile, co-líder de Ciudades Más B y, dire y director de 3XI, ex director ejecutivo de Sistema B y licenciatario de TEDx Patagonia. También es arquitecto de la Universidad de Chile, fue consultor en México para Business Design Associates en el Instituto Tecnológico y de Estudios Superiores de Monterrey. Es un enamorado del emprendimiento social y participó en distintas iniciativas durante más de 10 años en la Fundación Mercator. Así que eh, ya les vamos a estar enviando para que se agenden en sus calendarios y el próximo registro de Zoom para que lo puedan tener presente. Muchas gracias por llegar hasta acá, muchas gracias por compartir esos mensajes tan lindos en el chat. Nos estamos viendo dentro de un mes y medio y muchísimas gracias obviamente de parte de, de todo el equipo de Impacto por estar acá presentes, por toda esa buena onda y a BMW Foundation por esta posibilidad. Nos estamos viendo el mes que viene. Adiós. Chao, chao. Chao, chao. Nos vemos. Chao con todos. Adiós. Nos vemos. Chao, chao. Hasta luego. Saludos a, a la ciudad de Córdoba. Gracias. Fantástica. Oh. Fantástico. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Gracias, gracias. Excelente. Gracias. Gracias. Chao, chao. chao. No pensaba que todo era en inglés. Me hubieran dicho, hubiera dicho las cosas en castellano. <risa> Teníamos ahí la traducción. Navarro y Mokovki, qué gente maravillosa. Y no soy Mina, soy Diego. Chao. Está fantástico mi alter ego, muy bien, el masculino. Chao, Mina, cuídate. Buen alter ego. Chao a todos, gracias. Nos vemos, Chao. qué gusto tenerlos acá, lindísimo verte por acá, Mina. Sí, gracias. Francisco, Lucas, hermoso. Gracias por gracias por, por, por todos los excelentes eh, insights. Qué bien. Gracias. Gracias, Fabián. You gave me so much peace. Thank you.